Okay, I've had some people ask me about significant figures. How many should we uh, include in our answer? And I'm going to answer that right now with, uh, with a little bit of a story. A friend of mine grew up in South Africa. During the time that they were changing over from the British system to MKS uh, metrics, and it turns out that every every industrialized country in the world has switched over, except one, America. <laughs> anyway, um, as they were switching over, uh, my friend Graham says that there was a uh, a report in the paper of a, of a boat that sank off the shore of his, right there in his town. And the reporter went down to the dock and found an old fisherman and said, did you see the boat go down? The fisherman said, I, yeah, I did. So the, how far out was it when it went down? Arr, 250 yards. That's how fishermen talk. And uh, so the next day in the uh, paper, the headline stated, fishing boat sinks 228.5888448 meters off the coast. Now I ask you, is that what the old fisherman meant? No. The old fisherman meant, what? It was further than a football field, uh, further than two football fields, less than three football fields. That's what he meant. This answer suggests that the old fisherman knew which molecule of water the boat went down on. <laughs> this is not more accurate, this is less accurate. This is a lie. That reporter thought, you know, he went and put 250 into the calculator and hit convert, wanted to be as accurate uh, as possible, so put all of those decimal places. It's a lie. Uh, should have been 230 meters. Now, just for practice, with your clicker, keep it out, you're going to do this quite a few times. How many significant figures in the number 25,000? Really quick, shouldn't take long. Okay. The answer is two. These zeros are just placeholders to give me the correct power of 10. Now, what if I put that decimal point there? How many significant figures are there now? Keep those clickers out. We're going to keep using them. Okay. The correct answer is 5. By putting that decimal point there when I didn't need to, I'm bragging. I'm saying I spent five million dollars on that machine and it can measure this to five significant figures. And it just so happened, coincidence, the last three were zeros. But those zeros are data. Now, what if I have this zero off to the right? How many significant figures now? Okay? Ah, we're not sure. The answer is six. By putting that zero when I didn't have to put the zero, I'm again bragging. I'm, I'm saying I spent more money than that last guy. And I can measure this to six significant figures. And just by coincidence, the last four turned out to be zeros. But they're still data. Now, what about this case here? How many significant figures in that number? <laughs> okay. The correct answer is four, good. Now, these zeros here are just placeholders giving me the correct power of 10. This zero that I didn't have to put 
to give me the correct power of 10, that's bragging, that's real data. And I can see that there's four significant figures when I write this in scientific notation, which would look like that. So in this one, everyone put C, we'll all get the right answer. Everyone put C. Okay, good job. We finally got one right. Whoa, oh, no. <laughs> Some outliers. Now, here's how I feel about significant figures. Many years ago, my friend and I were asked to go to Haver. Haver's not no place, but you can see no place from there. Um, we went to Haver to do a Danforth review for a professor in the physics department. We went there, we listened to his lectures, we poured over all of his exams for the last five years and all of his homework assignments. And when we were done, we pulled him in and we just beat him about the head and shoulders. We were just upset. I mean, we said, God, you've got the best job in the world. You get to teach physics. I mean, the people in the math department would give their eye teeth to do what you do. And yet, half of all the points on your exams are on, did they get the right number of significant figures? You're wasting your life and you're wasting your students' lives. And so we really railed on it. And that's how I feel. There is so much fun with physics we're going to learn that, that we don't have time to waste worried about, worrying about how many significant figures we got in our answer. Okay? Let the chemistry department do that. I mean, they're boring anyway. So, in this class, just give me two or three significant figures, just enough to let us know that you're doing it the right way, and you'll never lose any points on the exam or homework for not having the right number of significant figures. Okay? Now, there has been another complaint, and that is that uh, a promise was unmet, that up until now, the professor has not come close to to death. And I promised you on that first day that, that that would be part of the class. So, what I have here is some liquid nitrogen. Anyone know how cold that is? Very cold. Dang cold. It's liquid haver. Okay? It's 320 degrees below zero. And that's the temperature at which it boils. Now this stuff looks like water. But it boils at 320 below zero. Now, if we wanted to boil water, we'd have to get it up to 200 and, uh, 212 degrees in America. Canadians can do it at 100. But uh, uh, now, because of that boiling point, if I were to pour some of this in this flask, if I cap that off, that's a bomb and glass goes everywhere, shatters and... But I'm going to leave an escape valve. Yeah. Now you don't, don't have to go see Old Faithful, those of you from California. <laughs> Got that done. Okay. Now, typically, we put a rubber ball in there, we let it bubble and boil, and then we take it out and throw it down and it shatters. But we didn't have any rubber balls in the demo room here, so instead I'm just going to use my hand and we'll... What were you expecting? Huh? <laughs> Fingers everywhere? Listen carefully when I put my hand in. Did you hear the boiling? That boiling sets up a layer of gas, nitrogen gas, around my hand. Now that layer of gas protects my hand from the cold for a while. Now, when you buy a down jacket in the wintertime, it's not the feathers that keep you warm, it's the, the layer of air that's trapped in those feathers. We call that the Leidenfrost effect. And that will allow me to do this next demo, which is truly stupid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This demo has not always gone well. Um, many years ago, I was asked to give a 10-minute talk before the legislature in Montana in Helena. The, the governor and his entourage were down front. 
It was just a grim looking group, and I was very, very nervous. And I did this as part of explaining what we were doing in the physics department here. I did this as part of my, my talk. And I was so nervous, I was shaking so bad that I spilled down the front of me and it, it pooled right there and there's a scar. Anyway, <laughs> I was so nervous that I swallowed a little bit and it just expanded and expanded and the rest of the talk, every time I opened my mouth, I just belched and smoke would come out. So it was really a, a fiasco. Um, I, do, I do need to warn you, uh, liquid nitrogen is fairly easy to get here on campus it's cheaper than root beer. I mean, it's really just liquid water. Uh, no, liquid air is what I meant to say. Uh, nitrogen is what makes up, uh, that's what most of the air is, is nitrogen. And so if you take air and you cool it, you cool it, you cool it, if you get down to 320 below zero, it condenses into a liquid. And you can cool a gas by expanding it. If you've ever, uh, fired a, a fire extinguisher, I'm not saying that you should do that if there's no fire, but if you do that, uh, you'll notice that the bottom of the fire extinguisher gets all frosty. When you expand the gas, it cools it, and uh, that's how they make liquid nitrogen. I just want to tell you, if you get some of this stuff, be very, very careful when you put it in your mouth. There was a grad student in New York who swallowed uh, a bit and, and they had to save his life with many, many operations because it was just ripping him apart inside. So if you, if you do this demo, you definitely want to get it out of the mouth as quickly as possible. And don't swallow, okay? Um, again, it's the Leidenfrost effect, the boiling that protects uh, your mouth. Now, after class, if anyone wants to put their hand in that, you're welcome to. I only ask that you not get your sleeve in there. You don't want it to soak into your clothes and be up against your skin. And don't have any jewelry on the hand that you put in. And don't linger. Don't just leave it down there. Just in and out, okay? Reach for the bottom. Okay. Now, last day we talked about this problem at the end of class. You and a friend stand on the edge of a 40 meter cliff. You throw a red ball straight up to 30 meter per second same time your friend throws a ball down at the same speed. We wanted to know which was going faster uh, right before they hit the ground, and how much later does the red ball land in the blue ball? Now, just to remind you, we use the operational definition of acceleration. If gravitational acceleration is 9.8, call it 10 meters per second per second down, that means that every second that goes by, you take what you have for velocity and you add 10 meters per second down. So 30 up plus 10 down gives me 20 up. 20 up plus 10 down gives me 10 up. 10 up plus 10 down gives me zero. And then every second that goes by, it speeds up by 10. And so we found that the two balls were going exactly the same speed right before they hit the ground 40 meters below. Now quickly with your neighbor, find out how fast they're going right before they hit the ground 40 meters below. It's not hard. You should be able to do this very fast. How fast are they going right before they hit the ground? Okay, this is a one-dimensional motion problem, so I make my list. <coughs> the 
If I choose my coordinate system to be positive up and negative down, then my acceleration is going to be a minus 9.8, call it 10 meter per second per second. My initial velocity is going to be up, so it's for the red ball, so it would be a positive 30. And my delta y, again, I told you this last day, I'm going to tell you again, because people keep making this mistake, you don't have to worry about the distance traveled. You just have to worry about the displacement from the first starting place to the last ending place as the crow flies. So that's going to be a minus 40. And then you're looking for this, so that makes this the who cares. And you just plug and chug. Now I think many of you are, are missing the point that any problem where you're dealing with motion in one dimension, either it goes left or it goes right, or it goes up or it goes down, or it goes up the track or down the track, those are one dimensional problems. And those are the types of problems you, you solve with these uh, five variables. That means that all of these problems with tracks, and there will be one on the midterm, every track has its own list. You know, this track uh, has its list, this track has its list. On this problem that you worked, you found that the velocity here was 8 meters per second. And you knew that it started uh, from rest, that's a V, and that it was on this track from t equals 0 seconds to t equals 2 seconds. Well, that means the initial velocity is 0, the final velocity is 8, the time on the track is 2, I can find the length of the track, I can find the acceleration on the track. Okay, and you found the acceleration to be 4 meters per second. Per second. And since this is the positive x direction, this is the negative x direction, how do I know that? Because I called this positive, and that's the, the final velocity is going down the ramp. So I define my coordinate system there. So this is going to be an acceleration vector like that. Over here, I would have the same acceleration, and so I put it in here as a minus 4 meters per second per second. My initial velocity would be 8 meters per second, positive. My time on the track is 0.5 seconds. Again, I've got two blanks I could solve for them. Okay, these are all plug and chug. Okay. Now, if I were to ask you, how high did it go? Could you do that in your sleep? You should be able to. You want to use the fastest speed it travels up or the slowest speed of zero? The average. And the average is halfway between the fastest and the slowest, halfway between 30 and zero, or 15. On average, this ball goes up 15 meters every second for three seconds. How high did it go? 45 meters. We've done this problem before. Okay? <coughs> now, let's talk about that tutorial this week. You found that in your car there are three ways to accelerate, three accelerators. If you have an acceleration vector in the same direction as your velocity vector, you are using your gas pedal. You are speeding up on a straight road. You are not using your steering wheel, just your gas pedal. Now, the change in velocity that happens every interval of time has to be in the same direction as that acceleration. So I added a change in velocity in the same direction, making the velocity vector longer and longer. If I have an acceleration vector in the opposite direction, well now, I'm using my brake. And the acceleration gives me the direction of the change in velocity. Opposite the velocity makes the velocity vector shorter, and shorter. Now, if that acceleration is not in the same direction as velocity and not in the opposite direction, the only thing left is perpendicular. And in that case, you're using your steering wheel. You're changing direction. You're doing it with cruise control on because you're not changing your speed. 
you're adding a little change in velocity perpendicular that changes the direction of your vector. Now suppose I have a truck going around an elliptical track at constant speed. And you notice that I emphasize that word speed. It can't be velocity. I can't go around that track with constant velocity. Why not? Velocity has, direction. velocity has direction. You can't go around a corner with constant velocity. Now, if I were to ask you where the acceleration would have the greatest magnitude, you'd know the answer. You felt it. It's here. Acceleration is something you feel. That's why you pay money at Disney World, to feel acceleration. When you speed up, you fly backwards. When you slow down, you fly forwards. When you turn right, you fly to the left. That's what you, that's exciting. That's what you pay your money for. Now, if you're going around this track at 60 miles an hour, you know you feel it more here than you do there. Now we can show that with vectors. If I look at the velocity vector there, and I want to know what does the acceleration look like? Well, the acceleration is how much that velocity vector changes in one second. So let's look a half second before and a half second after. If that's a half second before and that's a half second after, that's one second, okay? Well, those two vectors have the same length, same speed, but they're not the same velocity. And I can see how different they are by putting them tail to tail and finding the change vector. The change vector is what I have to add, there's a plus sign right there, to the earlier velocity to get the later velocity. Now because that change happened in a second, that is the acceleration. Now if I did that same thing at this other part of the track where it's more, uh, more severe, again I go a half second before, a half second after. These vectors are the same length as each other, indeed they're the same length as the earlier vectors. But now you can see that those vectors are drastically different. They're different in direction. When I look at how different they are, I put them tail to tail, I find the change vector that I have to add to the initial to get the final. That change happens in a second, so that's my acceleration. I get a big acceleration here where the curvature is tight, a small acceleration here where it's Gentle. Okay, that's just a quick review of what you learned in this week's tutorial. Now, what if you speed up as you go around this track? Well, your velocity vectors would get longer and longer. Now, if I asked you for the acceleration here, with your finger, just point in the direction of the acceleration. Everyone, come on, you can do it. Okay? Everyone, I think pretty much everyone's pointing in the right direction. It's like that. Now, folks, I want you to see that as a combination of two flavors. There's three flavors of acceleration. Speeding up, slowing down, turning. And just like ice cream, you can mix it. In this case, I'm turning left. And that takes an acceleration, which is 90 degrees to the velocity. I'm also speeding up with that gives me an acceleration that's in the same direction as the velocity. Okay, when I add those two components, the gas pedal and the steering wheel, I get this vector that's less than 90 degrees. Okay? Now, what you should have learned, what the takeaway was from that tutorial, is if I've got a car, Those are the wheels I can't draw. The velocity vector always goes out the front windshield if you're going forward. Now, if I want to turn right, I have to have an acceleration like this. If I want to go straight but speed up, uh, or slow down, let's do slow down. That would be an acceleration that would slow me down. But it would not turn me. If I'm turning right and slowing down, I would have to have both flavors. Likewise, if I wanted to turn left, I'd have to have an acceleration like this. 
And if I wanted to speed up and turn left, I would have to have an acceleration like that. Now people, you have to be careful with your words. I find that after this tutorial, some people are worse off than they were before. They get broken by the tutorial. Why? Because they're lazy and they just memorize a very simple little formula. They say, oh, if the angle between the acceleration and the velocity is less than 90, that's speeding up. How many of you came away from tutorial with that? That's wrong. Sick and wrong. If the angle between the velocity and the acceleration is less than 90, that's speeding up. Finish the sentence. And turning. And turning. Okay? If the angle between the velocity and acceleration is greater than 90, that's slowing down. And turning. But if you're on a straight road and you're not using your, your steering wheel, then by golly, speeding up is zero degrees. It's not less than 90, it's zero. And slowing down is 180 degrees. Okay? Period. Okay, the end of lecture. No, it's not the end of the lecture. We're going to keep going. <laughs> Let's look at this homework problem. Um, in this problem, we're told that a skeeter bug was observed <coughs> on the surface of a pond. And the students that watched the skeeter bug gave us these notes. Now, we know that the skeeter bug started from rest at point A. And we also know that the skeeter bug stayed on that path. What we don't know was whether the student understands physics. Okay, we think that maybe the student made some mistakes. Now, we don't know what the bug was doing at any point during the travel. The bug could have sped up, slowed down, cruise control. But we know that it stays on the path. So we're not asking, is this right, what the student drew, but could it be right? Is it possible that these vectors describe the motion of that skeeter bug? Let's look at that first point. If the bug starts from rest, then by definition, the velocity is zero at A, by definition. Now the question is, what direction should I what direction should the acceleration vector point? Now, that's the, that's the whole topic of <laughs> problem three and four in your tutorial homework, is trying to develop that idea of what does your acceleration look like when you start from rest. Now, remember, there's three flavors of acceleration, speeding up, slowing down, and, and changing direction or turning. If I'm starting from rest, if I'm taking that first step, can I be slowing down? You can't slow down from stop, people. That's, that's as slow as it goes, okay? Can I change my direction? What if I'm on a curved path? Am I changing my direction? Technically, no. If you start with zero velocity, you don't have a direction to change. And so that means on that first step, all you're doing is speeding up. And that means that your, your acceleration vector has to be along the path, in the direction of the next velocity. And so that means that this vector for, at A is correct. It's got to be tangent to the curve. Okay? So I get yes for both of them. Now, what about that velocity vector right there? Is that wrong or sick and wrong? <coughs> sick and wrong. The velocity vector is always out the front windshield. It's in the direction you're going. If this bug is following that path, I've got to have a velocity vector that's tangent to the path. So that velocity vector is wrong. What about this acceleration vector? Could it be right? No. If I, if I look at this as a, as a car, the car's going that way, would this vector make the car turn right or left? Yeah, it's going to turn to the right if that's the acceleration vector. 
But this bug turns to the left. If I'm looking down on this as a racetrack, the bug's turning to the left. And so that means that acceleration is wrong. I've got to have something towards the inside of the curvature. Now it doesn't have to be that direction. That direction indicates that the bug was speeding up there. We don't know what the bug was really doing. I could have had 90 degrees up there if it was cruise control, or greater than 90 back like this if it was slowing down. Any of those would be acceptable. But it has to be on the left side of the track, into the curvature. Now, what about that velocity vector at C? Is that good? That's good. Now what about that acceleration there? That's 90 degrees. 90 degrees is cruise control. That's okay, right? No. 90 degrees is cruise control and turning. Is that bug turning? No, that's a straight track. And so this acceleration is impossible. That would make the bug turn to the right. The bug can't stay on the path if it turns to the right. So I can either have something in the same direction or the opposite direction or zero. Those would be my three choices. If the bug's speeding up, it would be the same as the velocity, the same direction. If it's slowing down opposite, if it's got cruise control, it would be zero acceleration because it's not speeding up, not slowing down, and not turning. Okay, let's look at this point D. Is that velocity vector okay? It's tangent, so it's okay. Now, the student said that the acceleration of the bug is zero. No acceleration. Can the bug turn that corner with no acceleration? No. If you're turning, you're accelerating. And so there has to be some acceleration towards the inside of the curvature. I've indicated one that suggests the bug is speeding up. I could also have had one that was 90 degrees this way or this way. Uh, that would be cruise control. I could have had greater than 90 degrees up that way, which would be slowing down. Now if I look at E, that velocity vector looks wrong. It's got to be tangent. But if I correct the velocity vector, is this a possible acceleration? Yes. Yeah. It means the bug was speeding up there. I don't know what the bug really was doing, but that's possible. And so the answer is yes. Now, we are told in the problem that the student got these vectors right, correct. What's the bug doing there? Slowing down and turning right, okay? Slowing down and turning right. Good. Okay. Now you've noticed, if you've looked at the sample exams, that every single sample exam has one of these two-dimensional uh, acceleration problems, where you have to give the direction of the acceleration relative to the velocity vector. Okay? Now, really quick, really quick. Let's look at this problem where the, where the kid was on the swing. Now, the velocity vectors are the direction you're going, and the kid speeds up as he goes downhill, he slows down as he goes uphill. And so that means the fastest speed is gonna be right here at the bottom. So that's going to be the fastest velocity vector. I'm going to have slower here, slower there, and these are the turnaround points here. Now, if I look at this point B, that's a velocity vector. What, what flavors of acceleration do we have at B? They're speeding up, slowing down, and turning. Is it speeding up at B? Yep. Yes. Is it slowing down? You can't speed up and slow down, so no. Is it turning? Yeah. It's on a curved path. So in order to speed up, I need an acceleration that's in the same direction. That's not helpful. An acceleration in the same direction as the velocity. And in order to turn, in this case turn uh, to the left, I would need an acceleration perpendicular. 
that's going to give me a total acceleration that is less than 90 degrees with respect to velocity. If I look at this point D, at that point we are slowing down and turning left. That's going to give me a total acceleration that's going to be greater than 90 degrees. If I look at this point here, I'm not speeding up, I'm not slowing down. I was speeding up, I will be slowing down, but this is a transition point. All I'm doing here is turning left. I'm still on a curved path. So the acceleration would point 90 degrees. Now these, these points where you start and stop, since this is the first step and this is the last step, they have to be, you'll learn this in problems three and four of the tutorial homework, they have to be tangent to the curve. Tangent to the curve. So that's the correct answer to that problem there. Okay, let's look at this tutorial homework problem. This is on the last page of the tutorial homework. You have an object that's going around an elliptical track. And for some reason that you're not told, the acceleration vector of the object always points towards the red dot. Now, this would be the case of something that was orbiting the sun, say. This would be true of the Enterprise as it was coming back in with the, with the whales and what could be argued as the, the worst of all the Star Trek movies. Anyway, be that as it may, the first question is just, can you draw all the acceleration directions? Well, they told you they point towards the red dot. That's not hard, okay? Uh, now, it gets harder when we are asked about the velocity. The velocity is tangent to the, to the path. But the question that makes it difficult is, how long should I draw those vectors? If I assume that this vector is the correct length, how long should I draw the vector at B? Should I draw it the same length, longer or shorter? What do you think? Longer. Now the question that you need to ask yourself is, what's happening What's happening between points A and B? Any point in between A and B is going to have an acceleration vector less than 90 with respect to the velocity vector. So I'm speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. It's going to be longer. Okay? Now, here's the big question. What happens, uh, what, how would I draw it at C? Compared to B, would it be longer than B? equal to B or shorter than B. So think about that and we're going to use our clicker to answer that question. I can always wash my Okay, with your clicker, people. The magnitude of the vector at C is greater than, less than, or equal to the magnitude of the vector at B. Should I draw C longer, shorter, or the same as B? Really quick. Okay, last call. Oh, we don't know. We really don't know. Now, folks, at C, the angle is 90 degrees, indicating at C it is not speeding up, it is not slowing down. However, that's not important. What's important is what's been happening all the time from B to C. All afternoon it was going from B to C. What was it doing during that time? 
any point that I choose between B and C has an angle between those vectors less than 90 degrees. That means speeding up. So if it's going 100 miles an hour here, and it's speeding up, 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 oh, right there I take my foot off the gas. Is my vector here going to be longer than B or the same as B? Longer. That's going to be the longest vector right there. The longest vector. Now, we said that 90 degrees was cruise control. Well, generally yes. But there's also this other case of a transition point. That's the point, that's the, the time when you took your foot off the gas and you're headed for the brake. Everything before this we were speeding up, everything after we're slowing down. Now you'll notice there are four transition points in this problem. This is a transition point that's 90 degrees. This is a transition point that's 90 degrees. This is a transition point that's 90 degrees. And this is a transition point. So this object was speeding up till it got to C. It slows down till it gets to E. It speeds up until it gets to F, and it slows down until it gets to A. Check that your neighbor followed that, please. We have three minutes. <coughs> With those three minutes, I want you to turn over your uh, exam preparation sheet. On the back of that exam preparation sheet, there's a roller coaster problem. Now, we'll go over the whole problem on Monday, but for now, I just want to work one part of it right before we leave just to let you know whether you're ready for the exam. The roller coaster car starts from rest at A at T equals 0.6 seconds. It gets to B at 5.6 seconds and the distance from A to B is 50 meters. What is the instantaneous velocity of the cart at B? This will be the last clicker question. If I take 50 meters and I divide it by 5 seconds, I get 10 meters per second, and that is a velocity, but what flavor of velocity? Average. That's the average velocity. Now, if it starts with zero velocity and it ends up uh, with an average of 10, the final velocity must be 20. The answer is D. D. Now, folks, if you had seen that as a one-dimensional kinematic problem and had made your list of variables, <coughs> V initial would be V at A, that would be zero. V final would be V at B, that's what you're looking for. Delta X would be 50, and delta T would be five uh, seconds. I've got one, two, three pieces of information I can solve just by plugging and chugging, and I would get 20. Have a good weekend, people.